Hey, I know what day it is, cursed cursors. It's Thursday of the third week. Jenny T minus what? 20. Jesus. 20. No. 18. 18. 18, 17. Jesus. We take a little trip. days left. Wow. Morning, Jenny. Morning, Scott. How are you? Great. So, so good. I'm ready to crush the world today, David. Let's rock. <laughs> really? You feel it? You feel it? Jenny no. sounded tentative, but Nick Taylor Vasey's here. How are you, Nick? I'm good. I'm wide awake. You know what gets you awake in the morning is uh, a close encounter with a house centipede. Oh, boy. Now I'm up. Mm. I don't even need coffee. I'm good to go. You had a bug on your body in the sleep in your sleep? I don't know why you would assume it was on my body, but I, I did. <laughs> <That's pretty close. laughs> well, what? how else would it wake you up? It didn't wake me up. It, like it, like I was. It, I, it I was, was watching just, I, TV. I, I, it was that big. <laughs> I'm just saying. You see these things in your in your space, and you say, "Get out of my space." That's all. So I'm up. All right, and you were wired. And yesterday, big day on the campaign trail. Tell us about it, Nick. Jesus, big day. Yeah, lots, lots happened. Um, I should I should start by saying that you guys uh, on the podcast yesterday were talking about how you hate platform days, and um, I think now I do too. I forgot that lockups are actually as stressful for journalists. As you were locked you down and em- <laughs> you were locked up and embargoed. How was that? Well, it was boring and 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 with a deadline at the end. So I mean, you know, it's an interesting <laughs> document and fun to talk about with people, but. <laughs> You know, couldn't even take my mask off. Um, but yeah, it was a big day. Uh, obviously, lots of commentary on on what Trudeau's promising, which is a lot of spending, um, a lot of revenue too that he's going to raise, but not nearly as much as he's hoping to spend. And uh, and and now tonight is uh, debate night, so so we're right in the middle of it. Hmm. Awesome. Um, and uh, what's your take on the platform? My take on the platform is that David, I'm a journalist. I don't get, I don't get opinions. <laughs> oh, really? I noticed that in the political playbook that there's no opinions. There's no attitude to that document at there's all. No, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> um, no, I mean, hey, you know, they were talking about having a nice big idea, uh, or at least the, there was this there was this reporting that the party was still looking for this big thing. And I know you guys talked a bit about that yesterday, and um, and. I don't know that there was a, a big new thing, but when you add up all the things they already announced and put in this document, maybe it's not big and new, but uh, it's big, <laughs> you know, like it's a big thing, uh, big, yeah. a big, a, a big document to put out there for people. Um, and, and maybe, you know, not, not too many contrasts to the conservative document. I mean, there are policy differences, but if you guys, as you guys have talked about, there's, there's a, this, the, the, the contrast between O'Toole and, and Trudeau is, um, perhaps narrowing. Yeah, maybe you maybe you disagree. Right. And, though. <laughs> no, I don't actually. I don't. I mean, there's some wedges in that document. We'll get into them, but not on balance. So, hey, today, anything other than prep debate prep for everybody? This is the TV uh, the, French the, debate. The only thing, yeah the the only thing before the TV debate is is Chickmeat Singh is going to a couple of parks in Montreal, and he's going to serve up poutine. So he's taking a break from. I guess, you know, this intense <laughs> debate prep to go give Punjabi uh, Putin to his uh, his potential constituents in that city. Uh, and he's he's somewhat I wonder how Trudeau for, has for lied about Putin. How, how has Trudeau lied about Putin? Because that that's be got to come thing. up today. So yeah. yeah, he can't deliver on Putin. He says, he <laughs> says he's going to pour gravy. <laughs> but he never pours the gravy. He just serves up dry Putin. Cheese curds. <laughs> Cheese curds with fries. You can't count. <laughs> It's, isn't that the most cliche thing in the world? Like, Putin, I'm going to Montreal to go serve poutine. Isn't it like, what's he going to show up like at a Bombardier skidoo and, uh, you know, yeah, wear no. like a, a beaver skin hat or something? Like, I mean, it's kind of like, it's a bit, uh, it's pretty cliche. Isn't Do it? a photo op with Bonhomme. Mm-hmm. You guys are so yeah. cynical. <laughs> we are. We are, but uh, no more cynical than the NDP campaign, I'll tell you that. Um, okay. Nick, thanks a lot for dropping by. We'll see you tomorrow to talk about the debate. Yeah, sure thing. See you guys. Bye. Should every, everybody should check out the political playbooks out? Yeah, it's out. It's, it's, it's out. Go. All right. Check it you out. It. All right. See you guys. Thanks, brother. Bye. Okay, how should we start off today, Frankie? Yeah. 
Yeah, and after Frank, I have a question for you about polling, David, based on another pollster. Great. So, so I hope that's your thinking cap you got on. Yeah. Because uh, exactly. I'm looking for some brain. Four-day roll-up. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. 14, 1,350 cases. 36 conservative. 30 liberal. 19 NDP. Four green. Six People's Party. Five Bloc Quebecois. No the three-day roll is effectively no different. Ontario tied. Hmm. Okay. So let's talk about the platform yesterday. Oh, so you got a question about polling. I just Go had ahead. a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our, our, our friend Greg Lyle, who I think we both think is a really good pollster, um, yeah. really, really good pollster, also came out with a huge uh, poll last night. And one of the things that he found that he profiled and thought was interesting is uh, is that he said he sees time for a change as a sentiment rising substantially. And he sees that, and, and we've talked about this indirectly. I think Jenny's talked about it directly a couple of times. But Trudeau and the leadership of Trudeau as a factor in this campaign, and he says that his leadership, um, his leadership attributes are melting and that time for a change now is approaching 2015 levels and it's exceeding 2019 levels. I don't feel that out there, but... You know, when you when you have a lack, are you out there, campaign, Scott? I are am, you David, fucking out there? You're David, not out there. You live no, in a bubble. You're wrong. You I'm like a, a groundskeeper. Bubble. I'm out there, man. I am. No, you are. I'm you walking. are. You are. You are very bubble like, uh, Scott. I'm not. I'm no the, way, man. the one also thing I just <laughs> super, want, I, uh, th- that, that tread pool, on my shoe. I'm. I'm out there. That pool was doesn't it was feel massive, like it out there. It. Can I know? I'm just going to add to this because I want you can. So one of the other uh, factors in that poll that that um, that I saw was he he had a he had a, a a question of people that definitely plan to vote and and if they were what how aware they are of the election and of of his of the sample forty percent of people who are definitely planning on voting have seen nothing about the election they know it's on and that's yeah. it and nineteen percent of people um, somewhat as in they have seen one thing in the election but otherwise haven't been paying attention so. I'm not sure how that factors in well, David. So go. Or can I just be, well, that would be the, the thing I specifically want to know. <laughs> I can't help it, David. I want to know this. I want to know this. Like, is it, is there actual sentiment for time for change rising as a mood in the country? Or is it that if you do two and a half weeks of a kind of lackluster, or ain't got a sharp reason for calling it, does that start to weigh down on your leadership numbers? And you know, you know what I mean? Are we looking at a cause or, a, or an effect is what I'm asking. Well, I don't even know where to start. I would say on uh, Jenny's point that anybody that's been watching my Through the Looking Glass series would have already known what Greg found in his survey, which is that people are really not following this terribly closely and and don't see a lot of importance in it, uh, don't see a lot of reason to follow it that closely. There's not a huge sense of consequence uh, about it. Jenny, I don't think those people are going to suddenly get super informed. I don't believe this Labor Day uh, shtick about all of a sudden people are going to take out their textbooks and start studying platforms and following the nightly news. But is that not, but David, is that not like, if you're, if you're in the liberal campaign, does that not give you some hope? Like if you're going to have a, a bad shit, the bed kind of two weeks, it's better to do it when essentially uh, 60% of the electorate that plan on voting are not paying attention at all. Yeah, for sure, Jenny. And yes, there's hope because you know, two and a half weeks ago, three weeks ago, people knew zero about Aaron O'Toole. And now maybe they know two things and they've improved their impression of him. They hear one thing and it's a negative thing. That's now one of the only the three things they know about him yeah. and one of them's negative. I mean, like, there's a lot of room to shift his position, to shift his positioning. So, yes, absolutely. Scott, it's got to be time. For, it's got to be the campaign that's driving up the time for a change numbers because uh, there's nothing exogenous to the campaign that would be moving that number in my view um over this period of time that greg has been polling um but nonetheless it remains the case that when the time for a change numbers are high jenny you know this if you got two weeks left and the country's mood is time for a change are you better off to convince them that you're better than you thought and therefore it shouldn't change? Or are you better off to convince them that their opponent, that your opponent is unacceptable and therefore they shouldn't change? Well, the, the, the second. You need to scare... You of need course, to, absolutely. 
of course the second. Um, anyways, well, I guess we'll, I guess we'll, I guess we'll see. Time for some hurly burly real talk. Most of you would go into extreme election watch meltdown if you suddenly had no access to a cell phone and data. I know I would. But it's equally real that for many young Canadians transitioning out of foster care, owning a cell phone is just an impossibility. Precisely why our presenting sponsor, TELUS, created Mobility for Good, a groundbreaking program that offers over 20,000 vulnerable young adults a free smartphone and data plan. Nothing less than a lifeline as they transition to independence, helping them stay connected to family, access resources they need for school, work, and to just survive. This is Samita's story. As a young child living in India, her mother died. Her family moved to Canada shortly afterward, and Samita was taken into foster care because of instability in the home. By the age of 16, she'd been cycled through seven homes and three high schools. By 18, the fear of somehow surviving and living an independent life was overwhelming. But Samita took courage from her literary heroes, made education her priority, and found support from TELUS and Mobility for Good. That gave her the phone she needed and access to data for the first time. She could check her email and university courses on the go. And she reconnected with her brother, separated from Samita since her early teens. The result? A four-year philosophy and business degree at McMaster and the McCall McBain Scholarship, funding her current studies abroad. Samita's is just one of so many inspiring stories, and TELUS is committed to providing services to our most vulnerable residents. TELUS believes we must work urgently and collaboratively to ensure that 100% of Canadians and Indigenous peoples living in Canada, including Canadians like Samita, can get access to reliable, high-speed broadband networks and connectivity by 2025. You can learn more at telus.com slash connectingcanada. So, Jenny, why don't you lead us off on the platform in this context? What did what did you see there that you thought? Well, it was definitely listen. It was a it's a it's a hail mary, like what I said in the uh, in the uh, playbook today. Uh, it's a seventy eight billion dollar uh, uh, hail mary. A lot of recycled promises from uh, uh, from the past. A lot of the buzzwords that uh, Trudeau likes to talk about: climate, you know, energy, you know, you know, green energy, the jobs of tomorrow, today, that kind of, uh, that kind of bullshit stuff. Um, there was, some, and, and then of course there was like the dog whistle stuff, guns, abortion, abortion was obviously just tied to be able to, uh, speak about it because the policy that he's talking about, um, uh, enacting affects two provinces in the entire uh, country. And he has also already said that he withheld, uh, transfer payments to New Brunswick over not funding abortions in, in the private clinic in uh, in Fredericton. So, um, I think, I think it was kind of standard in that regard. I think his biggest win though, uh, came by the fact that they cleverly actually costed their platform and put it out. So they said, we're costing the entire thing. We've given major planks, uh, to the PBO for them to cost as well. But what it did was, uh, for the first day on the O'Toole campaign, he didn't have a clean, uh, he didn't have a clean announcement. He didn't have a clean, a clean day, um, at the, uh, at the podium reporters were go kept going back to him and saying, what is your costing? What is your costing? What is your costing? And, uh, um, and it was, a, it, it was a, it was a definite, uh, it was a definite theme. So I think if they had one win, um, it was actually putting Aaron and the conservative campaign, uh, on the, uh, on the defensive. <clears throat> and just to, to follow up with you for just a second, Jenny, because I'm interested in how that plays. Do you do you think that the liberals can win a fiscal responsibility fight with the conservatives and that th this cleavage is about substance? Or do you think that O'Toole had a bad day just because he looked the man with a plan looked a little planless all of a sudden that the man yeah, it's, it's that he, uh, he looked prevaricating, he looked like a little less than sort of completely forthcoming about all that is it a character well, it, issue or a policy issue well it's it it's um uh it was uh, uh i think it was a little bit of both but but this is on the heels of course the the media his his answer yesterday when when asked i think just one question about it was ultimately the, ba the budget will balance itself and so i think a mm -hmm. win for trudeau on on the platform or economics is actually a draw because it was evident that they were pushing economists out all day uh, yesterday in terms of giving analysis because in the platform they're counting. Aaron said they're counting for a three percent growth um, in the economy. 
uh, over 10 years to uh, be able to pay down the, the deficit in 10 years. Well, economists were saying, private sector economists are saying it's 1.7% per year, and it hasn't been 3% of, 3 of a year in 20 to 25 years. And so it's kind of a, it is a very lofty assumption to make to say that is what you're, how you're going to uh, balance the budget. So if, if Trudeau can fight Aaron on economics to a tie, it's a win for him. Yeah, absolutely. If he can, if he can do that, that's a huge, that's a huge win um, for him. Scott, they had the obvious wedge issues in there. How do you advance the abortion debate? You put something in the platform positively to do. They gave themselves a tool there. Guns, they gave themselves a tool there. Ban on handguns sounded familiar. We promised that in two thousand and six, um, and uh, and then the costing differential that um, that Jenny was talking about. On the other hand, I also saw yet more layers on the Christmas tree of spending without story or narrative um, attached to it. And at the end of the day, all Trudeau really seemed to want to fight about yesterday was vaccines. Right. So basically the whole platform was a prop to get a message out about vaccines. Well, and I think that that makes sense. I, I, uh, I, I sorry. I think the vaccines message makes sense, as you know, and you got Ontario with the passport questions about it. So I, I, I think that Trudeau's got to hammer on that wedge and got to try to make that thing stick to O'Toole in a way that causes people to question um, core decisions that O'Toole would make. Um, but the platform overall, like the wedge issues that we're talking about a moment ago, abortion and, and the costing issue and all that sort of stuff, it was so smothered in uh, program and spending. I mean, you've got a 162-page platform from O'Toole. You've got a $78 billion platform from uh, Trudeau. I just, I like, it's, to me, I saw it as very much of a Stan Pat day, a Stan Pat platform, like just Stan Patter, you were, you know, and it's just, it, it really, I go back to your point that you made uh, a couple seconds ago, David, when you put it to Jenny, you know, like, so if you're at this point, where you can see the NDP feel like maybe they've got a little bit of jazz. O'Toole is giving you all the fight you could possibly want. And the only thing that the first two and a half weeks appear to have convinced Canadians of is that maybe it's time for a change, that they have found what you've had on offer so lacking that they're starting to now think, hmm, you know, maybe my impressions of Trudeau as a leader are getting dented. Like, I, I just... I. I look at that and I go, well, that's, you know, that's, 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 that's time to, that's time to get a crisp, clear, singular message in front of people that resonates with them. And, you know, and Jenny and I were joking on WhatsApp last night, like I, this doesn't have a single message. This is, has all the messages. And it goes back to this stuff about modern campaigning. Like to me, I look like, I think this document, this is a recipe book and it's a recipe that allows you to send butter tarts to people who've told you through digital advertising feedback that they like better tarts. And, you know, 100%. you can sit and you can send a blueberry pie to people who've said, I want a wedge of blueberry pie and on and on and on. And I think that motivates and galvanizes your existing vote. But like, what if the recipe you need is to make your kitchen bigger? And I'm worried that the liberal kitchen is shrinking. And uh, even if they're effective in handing out to dessert, uh, that may not leave them in a good spot on September 20th. So I got lost in my analogy. I'm not sure. I think I have to go walk, knock some flour off my apron, but uh, I'll uh, <laughs> turn it back over to you guys. <laughs> so, Jenny, what do you expect to see out of the liberals from the rest of this campaign? I think it, we've seen, we've seen, I think we're just going to see more of the same. I think it's, it's going to be, yeah. uh, they're going to, they're, it's going to be a uh, wedge politics on abortion. It's going to be vaccines. I, I, I disagree with Scott and I don't want to get into it. I actually don't think vaccines is playing for him as well as he uh, thinks it is. Uh, there were thousands of people across the country protesting yesterday in terms of uh, mandatory, uh, mandatory vaccines. Um, I think it will continue to polarize. Tr Trudeau's strength in the past has been bringing people together. And I think a complete polarization of him being the messenger. There's a difference between sending surrogates out and, and attacks out on your opponents in terms of what they've said about abortion or other conversion therapy or whatever in the in the past. And there's another that the prime minister of Canada is, is standing up and basically scolding um, a segment of people for uh, for uh, not taking uh, vaccinations because because the vast majority of those people are not anti-vaxxers. They're people that actually are hesitant uh, of, of taking the vaccine because of things that they've heard. And so um, I think we'll see more of that. But I think if, if, if vaccines stay the main issue, then then I think that we will continue to see the liberal numbers uh, uh, go down. And I think we will uh, continue to see the time for the change numbers go up.
<laughs> whereas, whereas I there's and a poll out there today by some company I can't remember who that says that it's a sixty five thirty five proposition mandatory vaccination, um, and uh, the question is so that's a pretty good wedge to be on the sixty five percent side of a sixty five thirty five wedge, but the question is whether it's a vote determining wedge or not on the sixty five percent side. Well, and it's more of his demeanor. Like I'll just say for the final time, this was the first two and a half weeks of this campaign was a Justin Trudeau we had never seen, like like conservatives might see it, politicos might see it, but Canadian or Canadians for the most part saw a petty, a flailing, nasty, mean, mean guy. And that, and, and, and I think that that isn't a, that is not, that plays against all of his core strengths that we've seen over the last, you know, six years he's been prime minister. And then the um, seven years previous to that, that he was an MP. Yeah. And I guess my, you know, on, uh, on the vaccines thing, we have litigated a ton of times, my, my, where I agree with Jenny is that I don't think it's sticking as well as it should right now. I don't think they're executing on as well as they should. I thought Bill Blair was pretty effective yesterday. Um, you know, he was their he was their second they put up yesterday. But you can't compete against your own platform. And I thought he was pretty effective in his uh, in his run at Ford. It was the sharpest, hardest hit anybody from the federal liberal campaign has taken against Ford so far. Is it and because he ran at Ford, Scott? Is it because he ran at Ford? Is I, that what made it effective? I, I, I like, think so. Let me raise this question with you while you're talking about it, which is nobody knows anything about Aaron O'Toole, and he looks kind of friendly to people and looks like he's not a hard conservative. The only thing people know about conservatives in this country is Jason Kenney and Doug Ford. Uh, that's exactly where I was Why aren't going. they the defining face of conservatism for the liberal well, campaign? Well, th that's where I was going to go, which is that I thought that, you know, Blair's messaging was effective because it 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 was a, it was effective in terms of resonating because it, it 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 put forward in the crosshairs. And I think the thing the liberal campaign has got to do is find a way that feels authentic and real and interesting and important to people to get that 65% issue. And I think it could be even bigger, but at least that 65% issue working against O'Toole. It isn't enough to work, have it work for you. You got to get it working against O'Toole. So you got to, you got to invest in Ford and Kenny now, and then migrate that to O'Toole somehow. But if O'Toole is allowed to talk about puppies and you're off yelling uh, at Ford, that doesn't, that doesn't complete the logic train. You got to complete that logic train and make it make it a problem for O'Toole. Right now, that hasn't happened. Uh, back in the good old days, <clears throat> Jenny, one of those ads you complained about in 2004, in a similar circumstance, we put Harper in an ad because nobody knew anything about Stephen Harper. We put Harper in an ad with Mulroney and Harris on financial records and deficits. I, I remember it very, very well. Right. With, right. With, so with, you don't know anything about this guy, but... He's probably like these other two guys who you do know. Well, um, I, it's kind of a standard tactic, right? Yeah, and and when you guys put out that ad, um, uh, it was immediate. Uh, I was the Ontario desk for the campaign, and it was immediate the calls that I was getting in from campaigns and candidates about it resonating on the doors. And I remember telling the the, the gurus, the 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 higher ups, I'm like, this ad is really hurting us, and they're like, no. Jenny, just go go back and do your Ontario desk thing. And like three days later, like the, uh, they're like. Yeah, so that you, you you were right. Uh, that ad was uh, was hurting you. So that's that's probably what they're uh, what they're doing. I think that uh, that Kenny and Ford are are smarter for them uh, to tie him to. I know they were trying to with uh, with Stephen Harper, but I actually don't think that's gonna. I, I don't think that's. Um, I don't think that's going to work. I think people um, I've talked to a lot of candidates who have been knocking on doors and Stephen Harper's name does not invoke uh, any form of negative reaction. Any like pe like. It, it, as you said, 2015 was a change election, but people, for the most part, if they voted for us at any point, they looked fondly for Stephen Harper. That's Stephen Harper. So I think that that's probably why they've 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 transitioned into more of the Ford, and maybe we'll see Kenny uh, because yeah. Stephen, Har Stephen Harper's not the boogeyman they were trying to make him out to be. I, right, I, I'm 100 percent with both of you on this, right? Like, and and we'll see if they do an ad like that. We'll see the same chorus of. Uh, of poo pooers, right? We'll see. We'll see media going. Oh my god! It's just you know what? This doesn't work for you at this point. I'm quite. I mean, maybe it's worked in the past, but I'm positive it won't this time because it's so vulgar. You know, it's so simplistic. It's like, yeah, okay, fine. You know what else? You know, Roger Corman movies are vulgar and simplistic, but they're <laughs> awesome and they work, right? And it's time to go a little Roger Corman on O'Toole's ass, as far as I'm concerned. So our sponsor, CN, is sort of fixated on safety. The company spends billions on safety. It's the prime directive for CN employees. You can understand why. Trains are juggernauts on steel wheels. 
Once they're rolling, it takes them a while to stop. Extremely hot weather puts extra stress on a train. So does extreme cold. Trains sometimes haul hazardous goods. You get the picture. So CN operates with an extremely thick safety handbook. In recent years, CN experts have provided thousands of community first responders with critical training on dangerous goods. CN safety staff carry out methodical risk assessments along its main corridors. They've developed technology to minutely examine tracks and trains themselves for faults before faults become accidents. CN's aerial drones inspect bridges between inspections by human inspectors. Detectors scan passing trains for overheated bearings or steel wheels. Sensors underneath trains constantly scan rails. There's even ground-penetrating radar to expect conditions under the railroad ties. The company has a comprehensive cold weather plan, including technology to improve braking along the entire length of the train and another plan for extremely hot weather. The full range of safety technology is way too extensive to catalog here, but suffice it to say CN is relentless at minimizing risk. We like to say that's the CN way. And as you know, I've said it here before, please don't race a train to the crossing. Trains always appear to be moving more slowly than they really are. It's not a bet you want to make. Hey, let's not let uh, let's not let the events of tonight go by without a little pre advanced speculation. The yeah. TVA debate in Quebec. For those of you who are listening in English, which I presume is a majority of our listeners, uh, <laughs> TVA is the leading network in the province of Quebec, private sector network. It's hosting a televised debate between the leaders tonight, and you know we don't talk much about Quebec on this show because we're not experts in Quebec politics, particularly. But I know that these Debates often have a lot of influence, um, an influence that kind of escapes the attention of English Canada for a while. Certainly, you know, in, in 1984, if I can go back that bloody far, when when Mul everybody thinks Mulroney turned the election in the English debate, which was helpful to him. But the election really turned in the French debate a few nights before not because there was anything so consequential as the exchange that happened in the English debate, but because Quebecers looked at the field and said, well, one of these guys is a Quebecer, and that's Mulroney. And the other guy, the liberal leader, is an Anglo from Toronto who speaks Parisian French. Um, and uh, so, you know, um, there's a lot at stake tonight because uh, the liberals are reasonably in good shape, but their French support is always soft. Conservatives look like they may have some momentum in Quebec. The bloc are flopping around without a particular reason uh, for existing right now. Uh, the NDP are not reading anywhere. Um, I think I think it's interesting. I think it, tonight could be quite quite consequential. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I, I think I think it will be. As you said, debates matter more. Uh, I think electorally in Quebec than they they ever uh, do in English uh, Canada. I think the the first French debate was somewhat of a turning point uh, for. Uh, um, the campaign uh, in twenty uh, in twenty nineteen, um, and and just from a like kind of leader's perspective, Trudeau's heading into his third first debate. Fr French is his. If it's not his mother tongue, he's he was one of those kids that literally grew up speaking both languages from the time he started to uh, to started to talk. Blanchette, of course, is a uh, is a francophone, and uh, Singh's going into his second debate. So this will be this will be a this is a, a butterflies and nerves for the conservative campaign. There's you know Aaron's going into his first. Um, uh, his his first uh, leaders debate in a, in his what it is his second language and he's been he speaks French. I talked to you know francophone friends or bilingual friends and they're like his French has improved tremendously over the even since he's been elected leader. But it's a lot different having a one on one conversation or answering questions at the podium that, that you've you've gotten from a reporter when you've got people that are like like speaking back and forth and and talking faster than they normally would For talk sure. or or talking slang. Yeah. You know how we we talk we say things that that. That that others wouldn't like. You're talking slang in a debate, and you're the you know if you're an if you're an Anglo, you may not pick up on all of those nuances. Yeah, the Francos will do that deliberately to you, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And so I think that um, I think that's going to be an interesting to see um, uh, it, 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 how the other parties if ha if there's going to be any pile on um, on uh, on Aaron on this. Agree with all that real strongly. Um, 
I like it when you said that we're not experts in Quebec, particularly, David. Uh, not particularly. <laughs> particularly, we... I mean, pretty I follow, much. Pretty I follow good. Quebec but, politics like I follow the Security Council yeah, of the yeah. UN. That's a little bit of a shout-out to my Mark Kearney interview there. I remember in 2004, <laughs> after you know, uh, 21 years of being in, or 11 years or whatever it had been at that point, being in elected high office, uh, being regarded uh, roundly as fluently bilingual, bicultural, had lived and worked in Montreal his entire adult life. Paul Martin was reviewed after the first French debate as, holy smokes, who's this guy? He's not a Franco. He doesn't speak French. And um, it just goes to show you that this debate uh, places a different test on leaders when it comes to their language skills and so forth. And so I'm, I'm in complete agreement with you guys. And I actually think the mission at this point might be for Trudeau, uh, to, ju to just make certain that if the Quebec, if the Conservatives have anything going on in Quebec, tonight's the night to stall it. And I'm, I literally was thinking the same thing as you guys. I'd speak an idiom the whole time. I would just go back and forth with Blanchette, try to make it a two-man argument, and and just speak an idiom the whole evening so that he's left trying to you know get his footing, all that. Don't let Singh and his appeal break through the language barrier. Don't let O'Toole participate as though he's a... Uh, uh, fully conversant uh, option, and just try to put those guys in the corner. And uh, that, that even if all it does is solidify your uh, Anglophone, Allophone vote and get you back to where you wanted to be in that part of the um, province, that would be that, that would be a nice fastening of the vote right now, I think, for Trudeau. Yeah. All right. So, you know, we got a suggestion um uh, yesterday uh, from one of our listeners that we at some point talk about the tempers of our bosses. And we've run out of time this morning, but we're game to do that. <laughs> we're game to do that. So at, at, at some moment when the news is a little slower, could be tomorrow, you never know, we're going we're gonna to relax here and tell uh, some war stories about uh, bad days with our boss riffing off that NDP to or fail of the other day. I think that's fun. And I also want to, if leading up to the, to the next debates, I went through all like kind of notes that I kept over the years. Cause I, I kept notes and wanted to talk about all the fucking shit you guys did to us on the morning, every morning of like most debates. <laughs> <laughs> I'll really have would. fun reliving, reliving that. <laughs> modest. Right. Yes. Those modest victories. We modest, ba Putin. modest battle victories. <laughs> modest battle victories on the way to a crushing war defeat. Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, anybody got a quick curse to wrap up the show? A quick curse. Uh, my curse is uh, on the costing of the Tory platform. Um, I. Get it out there. If it's if it's bad, you might as well get it out there uh, now uh, and and ex be able to explain it. Uh, try to explain the the three percent growth, what have you. But it's the, the costing of the platform is not going to go away. Opposition parties do not don't get the same. Uh, they do not get the same buy that governing parties have in terms of costing of their documents. Yep. My curse is directed at all the pollsters in the country, including yourself, David. Uh, we're not permitted to talk about regions because the samples are too insignificant. And I want to know what the fuck is going on in British Columbia. I don't want to be told the sample is too small. I want someone to give me a big fat sample. I want someone to do a deep dive. There's too many contradictions in polls because those samples and the margins of error. Uh, and I, I, I'm desperate to find out what's really happening out there. Because if it's a three-way tie, that's one thing. But if it's a galloping lead for the Conservatives, it's another. And I've even seen that it's a galloping lead for the NDP in one poll. So I don't know what in hell to think. And I think it's important to know what to think about BC. For sure. A lot of seats at stake there. But one thing you're not seeing any poll show is the Liberal lead in British Columbia. There's well, a dispute that, about whether the how strong the NDP are. But there's no dispute that the Liberals have lost their positioning there. And you don't think if you have a really big sample size that that magic op uh, that magic uh, option will be produced? It will be like, Find my more God, liberals. we've been missing it. Hmm. It's like people in golf who hit till they're happy. Phone till you get a number that you like. Um, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> my kiss is just about the NDP campaign, which I think is really uh, fucking amazing. It is the kiss campaign. Keep it simple, stupid. They don't say anything complicated. They don't try to explain anything. They don't have a policy detail about anything. They don't make a detailed critique of the liberals in any way. They have one line, and they repeat it over and over again. Trudeau's a liar. He won't do what he said. He's always lied. He'll always lie. That's all they say. That's all Singh says. That's all their ads say, and they say it every day. 
And I'm just going to be interested to see if they if they can keep that up for the whole campaign and how that works for them. But it is it is single minded and it is dumbed down in a big way. I'm with you. I'm scared of it. I you know those guys are creeping around behind us and then we're in steel toe boots. So watch out. <laughs> watch out. All right. I want to uh, thank you all for listening, everybody. Again, we'll be back tomorrow, of course. I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail. I want to thank Frank Graves and Ecos for their polling data, Nick Taylor Vasey and Politico for their support, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye, Scott. Bye, Jenny. Have a great day. See you on WhatsApp. Bye, guys.